Our Father and our God, we just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit. So very grateful for the time you've given us to spend time studying your word together. We just give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise. We are so aware of our limitations. We thank you, dear Father, for the Holy Spirit, for the guidance, the direction, for the truth of thy word that we might grow in grace and knowledge of you. I pray that you would filter out all the ignorance, all the foolishness, just seal to our hearts only that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. We are studying together the second epistle of Corinthians verse by verse and in our last study together we were at verse 7 of chapter 11 second Corinthians chapter 11 verse 7 here the Holy Spirit is revealing the authenticity of Paul as the Apostle of Christ and the argument is gone that Paul has been filled with God's jealousy in the presentation the purity of the Word of God and the spiritual welfare of the believers at Corinth he's indicated that there are others who preach Jesus but who in fact are preaching with a different spirit and are proclaiming a different gospel and of course the possibility exists that the believers at Corinth may well endure such a one and therefore it is supremely important that they consider the credentials of the Word of God and of the messenger of the Word of God. I believe that we are to look at Paul as representative of the Word of God, not as an individual who in his own strength, his own wisdom, his own logic gave us a revelation, but one who was used by God to complete the Word of God, as we'll see later on. Getting then to the seventh verse, have I committed, have I committed a sin in humbling myself in order that you might be exalted? Is that wrong? And of course, that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ did, what he did for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Have I committed a sin in humbling myself in order that you might be exalted because I have preached to you the good news of the one true God without charge freely is that wrong is that something that someone should use to suggest that the message is not true when one looks at much of what is done in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ today and compares it to the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ there is a striking difference I believe that difference is being suggested here right here we see the grandeur of the program we see the logic of the goals we see the results of human effort we are faced with the arguments that if we're doing it for the Lord then surely it deserves our best and we have our eyes on grand programs and buildings and accomplishments something that can impress the hearers or the listeners we want to be proud of the operation. Yet, the Lord Jesus Christ simply presented the Word of God. He didn't go around cleaning up the slums of Jerusalem, and surely they were filthy. He didn't spend time teaching people how to make a living, how to better themselves, how to improve their health conditions, or a thousand other things. Now, I believe the Holy Spirit is saying, hey, if you are looking for the marks of authenticity and of authority, then is it wrong that the minister of God should have been humbled in order that we be exalted? Is it wrong that he proclaimed good news without charge? Is that wrong? In fact, I want you, I want you to know, verse 8, 
Now, if I read the authorized version, I get an idea, I believe, that's not in agreement with the context. It's not unusual. That happens. I robbed other churches taking wages of them to do you service. Well, I'm going to freely translate that, and you all not only have the right to disagree, but you should seriously question any translations that I make. I spoiled other churches taking sustenance in order to do service for you. I believe to translate the word wages is to be contrary to the thesis that the Holy Spirit is presenting in the completion of the Word of God. I believe it is extremely important that you recognize that Paul is called by God to complete and finish this book. He says so in the first chapter of Colossians, that he was, com he was called to complete the Word of God. And I'm taking that verse at face value, that when I see the work of Paul here, right here, I see the completion of the Word of God, and God did that without charge. In 1 Corinthians 9, the Holy Spirit tells us that Paul worked without wages. Therefore, it seems contrary to the thesis of 1 Corinthians to suggest that I ought to translate this word, which means to, me to meet necessities as wages rather than sustenance. In fact, I believe, I believe it's further explained in the ninth verse with the aorist tense. I was with you. I was in Corinth when I was present with you and lacked, my Bible says, or if you have the, the old King James Version, when I was present with you and wanted. That word translated lacked or wanted is an aorist. It's an aorist participle. While I was there in Corinth, I got behind once. There was a time when I got behind and I'm going I'm to translate what they have translated as lacked or wanted as fell behind or got behind. I don't know whether that, that meant on his rent payment or his grocery bill or, or whatever it was. I think Paul is saying that while I was there in Corinth, while I was there, there was a time when I got behind. However, at that time, I did not become a burden to anybody. That's a, that's a very free translation. I was chargeable to no man. I'm going to translate that I was not a burden to any man. I, di I didn't go around Corinth and complain that I was behind. I didn't lay any charge against the good news of Jesus Christ by bringing my personal situation into it. However, you ought to know that the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied that need, and, and I'm going to translate that, the brethren, the, the brethren who came from Macedonia made it up. I don't, I don't think that the text argues that this was Paul's continued situation at Corinth, but he says that, that it got so bad at one time that there was support or sustenance required from someplace else, and that's where it came from. In fact, in, in, in everything, I have always kept myself from becoming a weight to you, and I intend to do so from now on. You know, it seems odd that anyone who would question the authenticity of the message might lay hold of the fact that Paul did this without charge. I mean, that's an odd way to do it. I'm suggesting that there is clearly the inference in the text that there were others there proclaiming Jesus, but with a different spirit and, and the, a, the, a different good news who were in fact a burden and a weight to the believers at Corinth that had put them under a sense of responsibility and obligation. And that that is being contrasted uh, here with the, with the freedom of God, the grace of God. The 10th verse. Again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, translate it differently. Not in, 
in any way to suggest that the translation here is not a good one, but uh, to try and put it in maybe, I guess, in a little more modern English in order that we might fit it together with the context. The King James says, has taken a position, they've, they, they've basically taken the position that many of the scholars have, have not taken as the truth of Christ is in me. No man shall stop me of this boasting in the regions of Achaia. Now, that sounds like what the translation, sort of sounds like what the translators want you to believe is that Paul is boasting and, and that boy, nobody's going to stop him from boasting in all of these regions about the truth of Christ or, or because he is faithful to the word of God. Now, I don't think that that's what the verse says. First of all, it's an indicative. There is the truth of Christ in me. That's, that's the way I translate it. Not as the truth of Christ is in me. And I guess we can argue you know, about the difference of those two statements. But the word there, or as neither one of the... Neither, neither of them are in the Greek. It's simply the Greek word for is. It's okay. However, the tense and the mood would indicate that rather than saying, as the truth of Christ is in me, one ought, I think, posit translate it positively, there, there is the truth of Christ in me. There is the truth of Christ in me. Now, one could call that a boast, I guess, until we, we stop and think and remember that it's the Holy Spirit who's doing the writing. He's the author of this epistle, and there's a strong statement that this is the truth. Secondly, I want you aware of the fact that that is true of Paul. If you, if you turn with me over to 1 Timothy, it's a verse which I think you probably all know. 1 Timothy chapter 1. You might just look at the 16th verse. Uh, 1 Timothy 1.16. The argument, of course, is that Paul was really called out of an abyss. He was persecuting the church of God. He was putting Christians to death. Nevertheless, verse 16, for this cause I obtain mercy. What cause? In order that in me first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering as a pattern, as a prototype, is the word there, to those who would afterwards believe on him to life everlasting. That's you and me. Now, it does not seem to me that we're pushing the text to read that Paul is the illustration of redemption by grace, that Paul illustrates my redemption by grace and your redemption by grace. Now, I would suggest that Paul thought that he was a pretty good Hebrew of the Hebrews, Pharisee of the Pharisees, as touching the law blameless. One could not conclude that Paul had gone through the, the proper channels of seeing himself as a great sinner, desperately seeking God and eventually finding Him. That doesn't seem to fit what I see as this prototype. Rather, I see Paul as a self-satisfied legalist who was absolutely convinced that he was good enough, in fact, that he was right before God in all that mess and God struck him down. He wasn't seeking. He wasn't longing after God. He was not desperate for God. God struck him down. What I'm suggesting to you is the man that recognizes himself as a sinner and his need of a Savior is a man who is already redeemed and Paul was redeemed by grace, not seeking for it, not searching for it. As we found in the book of Romans, he considered himself godly. God considered him ungodly. He considered himself blameless before the law. But before God, he stood a sinner, an enemy hostile to God. He was not seeking God. And God struck him down. God sought him out. God redeemed him. Therefore, there is in Paul the truth of Christ 
because Paul is the prototype, the pattern of everyone who is going to believe after this to everlasting life. That's you and that's me. So there is a truth of Christ in me so that this boasting about me will not be stopped in all the regions of Achaia. It is not saying that Paul is doing the boasting, but that in fact the boasting is being done about Paul. And I'm going to suggest to you that the boasting is God's boast. That his good news and his gospel is freely given that Paul represents the truth of Christ without any apology. The Holy Spirit says that. And any other presentation of a, of, of a Jesus, of a, of a different spirit and a different gospel is not the truth of Christ. You know, folks, if the man didn't teach Jesus, if he came to Corinth uh, teaching Buddha, well, okay, so you know we don't even have to talk about that guy. The big problem is teaching Jesus, but it's a different spirit and a different gospel. And I think that the 10th verse here is a strong statement by God the Holy Spirit that the truth of Christ is revealed in Paul. Now, since it is true that until the New Testament was complete, until the Holy Spirit had used Paul to, to complete the New Testament, then to say that the truth of Christ is in, is in Paul, in me, is the same as saying that the truth of Christ is in the Word. And I believe that's fundamental, folks. Folk. It's, it's more than fundamental. It's, but it's fundamental to your growth in Jesus Christ and my growth in Jesus Christ. I don't believe God speaks to you any other way. If you are not, folks, in this book, God's not talking to you, okay? I'm not suggesting in any way that God has forsaken you or that you're headed for hell. Not at all. What I am suggesting is, if you are not in the Word of God, God is not talking to you. You know, we gather here to study this book, not to, to slap ourselves on the back and can congratulate ourselves that we are so faithful in the study of His Word. But we gather here humbly, recognize, dearly beloved, recognizing that around this world there are multiplied thousands of Christians just as eager and just as interested in the Word as we are. And that the truth is not in what I think might be true, but in this book. The truth of Christ is in me. I believe, I believe that's tantamount to saying that the truth of Christ is in the Word because the Holy Spirit used Paul to complete the Word. Dearly beloved, if we were to take our Bibles and cut out Romans, uh, Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Thessalonians, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews. I, I don't know whether we should cut Hebrews out or not. First, first, first and second Timothy, first and second Thessalonians. We wouldn't know the truth of Christ. Now that is a sobering thought. If we had nothing but the Old Testament, if we did not have, in fact, the epistles of Paul, we wouldn't know the truth of Christ. It's the very lifeblood of the church. Sometimes the pendulum is, is swung so far that people say, well, well all we need are, are Paul's epistles. That's all we need. We can just get rid of all the rest. Get rid of all the rest of it. Now, if you pushed me up against the wall and, and you said, now listen, Steve, I'm, I'm going to give you a choice. You can either have all of the Bible except what Paul wrote, or, or you can only have that which Paul wrote. Which would you take? Well, that's a tough choice. You know, that, that's kind of like saying, well, you know, I'm going to cut your favorite horse in two. Uh, which, do you, which, which half do you want, the front or the back? I mean, may, maybe that's a, a, a poor illustration. I don't know. I, I don't think that the Word of God is complete without both of those, of course. But I'd be a fool not to admit 
that my understanding of doctrine and your understanding of doctrine, whether you're willing to admit it or not, you know, is different, but your understanding of doctrine comes from those epistles. It is the very lifeblood for the church. The Old Testament writers, diligent, with great diligence and, and sought out, sought for what you and I know. What I'm, I'm trying to suggest is that the truth of Christ is not fully revealed until we have the epistles of Paul. I'm further being cautious, saying that that does not mean in any way that we should deify Paul or that we ought to only study Paul's epistles and, and just forget, uh, forget everything else. I believe the Holy Spirit is making a strong statement here, not some tacit admission that Paul boasts and that he can properly do so because he has somewhat of a, a reason to boast, but rather the indicative statement of reality that the truth of Christ is in Paul. It's revealed in Paul. He's the prototype. He's the pattern of how the Holy Spirit works in, the, in our lives, my life your life and is to complete the revelation of that truth and and it's not going to stop either in Corinth or in the entire region keep in mind that at that time at Corinth they didn't have all these epistles you know it had to be revealed in Paul the verse is saying I believe from yours in my standpoint today Paul represents the completion of the Word of God so in the, in the last analysis, the boast is about the Word of God. You know, boasting can be, you know, you, you understand boasting can be either good or bad. If you, if you lay claim to something that isn't true as a boast, well, that's, that's bad. That, that's evil, okay? If, on the other hand, that you lay claim to something that is true as far as the Greek mind's concerned, that's also a boast, but it's not evil, okay? Uh, you know, you, you may say you're the best lathe operator in the world, but you, but you don't want to boast, so you say, well, I'm not really that good, but I, kinda, I know where the switch is. You know, you're probably not going to get the job. If you say, that, well, I'm the best lathe operator in the world, there ain't nobody like me, it surely would not be a boast if you know how to do it and if you really are the best, you know. Uh, you know, to say, absolutely, I, you know, I can run, a, I can run a lathe. That's not a boast if it's a statement of truth. A boast can be either good or bad, depending on whether it's true or not true. And I don't see any argument in the, in the Word of God that the one should lie. Uh, it, you know, if, if you're the best lathe operator in the world it's nothing short of lying to say you don't know how to run a lathe or any other illustration that we might use as far as the boast is concerned i believe the stated purpose in the word of god concerning paul is that he be a prototype of the truth of christ and of the application of the grace of god through christ through the the finished work of christ to those that believe I believe Paul labored in a ministry without pay. He paid his own way. There was a, a time at Corinth when he got behind, even though he was working in the, the tent making trade, but he got behind and some brethren from Macedonia made it up. Uh, I, don't, I don't see that other than an indication of brotherly love. I have the secret hope that if I get in desperate straits and behind, that maybe some of my friends might come and say, well, here's Steve, you know, here's a, I'd like to help out a little bit. That's all I see in that. I do not see that to be translated wages. I do not think it ought to be translated wages. You know, he did not go on the payroll of other churches in order to work, to work at Corinth. I think the language strongly argues in the Greek that there was a time where he got behind and some friend made it up, and that may be true in all of our lives. You know, I praise the Lord for times when 
people have, have helped us out. Uh, I praise God for those who do help support this ministry, you know, that, that it may continue to go forward. That's the hardest thing in the world to accept. It's a, it's a whole lot easier to accept wages or pay. I think wages gives you an entirely wrong idea of what the text is saying. He, he didn't go on anybody's payroll because he's God's illustration of the greatness, the freedom of grace. That grace, you know, is freely bestowed by God. I think the boast is not only the truth of Christ, but the truth of Christ is illustrated in the freedom of that ministry. Verse 11. Wherefore, because I love you not, God knoweth. Does that mean he didn't love them? God knows that I do. You know, my Bible says, what I do that I, I will do, that I may cut off occasion from them who desire occasion, that in that which they glory they may be found even as we now. I think that verse says what the Greek text says. But one has to, you got to kind of ramble through all of the, the underbrush to, to a little bit, at least to make it out. I'm positively doing it. I'm going to do it. Uh, the attitudes of the Corinthians are, are, are not going to change it in order that I may cut off a base of operations for those who desire some kind of starting point, some kind of operations base. And, and you, you, you got to have something. Uh, pledges, goals, programs, buildings, what you know, whatever swimming pool, whatever it is, tennis court, whatever it is. I'm gonna I'm gonna cut off any base of operations for those who want such a thing in order that when they're examined, they're gonna be found the same way we are. They're gonna be examined the same way we are. You know, you're gonna be looked at in the same way we are. The word glory there um, in verse 12 is uh, the word boast. I believe God does what He does in order to, to cut off any base of operations from those who want such a thing in order that when they're examined, they'll be found, they'll be found exactly the same or they'll be examined under the same light, the same conditions as Paul, the Word of God. The... Uh, the reason that's necessary is that these people are false apostles. Now, when we got up to uh, this preaching, another Jesus, when we were in verse 4, back in verse 4, I suggested to you folks that that could be those who are heaven-bound and deceived. They're God's people, and they're ignorant, so they haven't thought it through. I still believe that, but I believe that the supreme emphasis in this context are those who are in fact Satan's messengers. Now, where do we look for Satan's messengers? Well, you can start on YouTube. I, you know, they're there. Uh, in where do we look for them? In the filth of the world's ungodly ways and means? No, the bars and the what? what are, no. No, these are false apostles, pseudo-apostles. There are pseudo-brethren. There is pseudo-truth. There is pseudo-doctrine, pseudo-apostles. You know, pseudo-love. We could, we could develop an entire systematic uh, Bible study on, on false application of that which is truth. You know, there are false apostles. There are deceitful workers. Now, that's an that's, that's a okay translation. Uh but I believe what the Holy Spirit wants you to see there, the word deceit is the basic Greek word for bait. These are workers who use bait. Bait. Y'all, you guys that fish, you women who fish, you know, you know, one of the one of the main reasons a fish gets caught is the bait. Bait is used as something that's attractive. It has within it some hidden little snare. And boy, there are a lot of those. You know, you're feeding on some preacher's sermon and, and, and there are a lot of good statements. They're, they're all very good. He's sure teaching the same Jesus. 
you know, uh, I am, and you know, you keep listening to them, and and then, but somewhere along the line comes these grossly untrue statements, and man, like a catfish, you know, because you'll eat just about anything, I guess. Uh, in the hook comes right into the roof of your mouth. Well, that's what this verse says. These are false apostles. First of all, there's the admission that they look like apostles, but they're not. They're false. Secondly, the, the great overwhelming illustration of their work is that they use bait of one kind or another, like, you know, so, sort of, well, if you'll just mail me five bucks with your prayer request, I'll take, I'll take it up to the Mount of Olives and I'll bury it and then and so there so it's the first one the Lord sees when he comes back. You know, kind of stuff like that. You know, there are false apostles. They use bait and they transform themselves into the apostles of Christ. That's a proper translation. You know, as long as you recognize that the word transform there is, is schema, not metamorphosis. That is, you know, it's an outward transformation. It's what an actor does. Okay, he, he transforms himself into the Tin Man and the Wizard of Oz by costume and makeup and, and or whatever he uses, but it's all outward. But he's still the same guy underneath. You know, uh, what, what you see is only outward transformation. Now that's the word that's used here. On the outside, they look exactly like the apostles of Christ. Now I caution you to look at the urgency of that verse. They look exactly like the apostles of Christ. That means you cannot tell by looking at them that they're false apostles. You have to look at the bait. I think the Holy Spirit's being just as blunt as he can be here, folks. You know, when he says that this guy is such a skillful actor that when you look at the schema he's put on, he looks exactly like Christ's apostle. And so the ability that I'm going to have to distinguish his falseness or his correctness is the bait, not his looks. Now that shouldn't amaze you looking at that that the man isn't going to do it. You're going to have to test the, the spirit. You're going to have to test the bait and the message, not the man, never the man, looking at the man. You know, he looks like an apostle of Christ. Now, that shouldn't amaze you. And no marvel, no marvel, the text says. No wonder. It's the Greek word for astonishment, amazement, wonder, and, and no marvel. Now, and it's an articulated Satan there. The Satan, you know, I want to make sure you understand that this is the devil here, <laughs> folks, the one that deceived Eve. You know, for these, these Satan transforms himself. My Bible says for Satan himself is transformed as though somebody else is doing it. It's a middle voice. And don't wonder at this for Satan the, the one you and I all know, the one that God has revealed, that Satan transforms himself into an angel of light. If you don't like the word angel there of, of light, that, it, uh, that is a messenger of truth. He transforms himself into a messenger of truth, of the truth of the Word of God. Once again, the word transform is schema. That is to say that on the outside, you don't look at him and you don't say, oh, that's Satan. Okay, hey, I, I, you know, I know what Satan looks like. He, he's got a long tail. He's got horns. He's always red. He carries a pitchfork. Yep, you know, recognize that guy instantly. Absolutely. You know, don't wonder at the fact that there are false apostles that they put on makeup that makes them look like Christ's apostles. Don't wonder that. Because Satan himself does that. That's what he does. He transforms himself into a messenger of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I think the Holy Spirit is being very blunt that he is a messenger of Jesus Christ where the scriptures declare Christ. 
You know, I am the light of the world, that God is light, and in Him is no darkness at all. Okay, so let's, let's don't pull any punches. What the Holy Spirit is saying is that Satan's favorite disguise, his favorite disguise seems like the, seems like the emphasis is there. What he does is make himself up to look like a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He doesn't make himself up to look like a minister of some false god. You know, I recognize there's Baal worship and all of those evil saints, and, and, and hey, I, I, I know all of that. But as, as far as the Christian is concerned, I think Satan has one activity for those who do not belong to him and another activity for those who do. I don't believe the great concern in the Word of God is for Satan's activities in the area where people are not God's people. You know, and if we haven't passed that hurdle yet, we haven't grown very much in the word, in the word of God. It's, it is clearly evident, folks, in God's word that there are those who belong to God, and then there are those who do not, never did, never did. And every every tree which my Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Surely the Holy Spirit is telling us there are some he did not plant. When the workers came to him and said, well, there's tear sowed among the wheat, he says, I didn't, I didn't sow it. Now, God could not be any clearer when he says he didn't sow the tear. He didn't do that. And there's an area of Satan's activity with tear that is dramatically different than the area of Satan's activity with wheat. Satan does have an activity among those of us who know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, I'll broaden that. Uh, Satan has a very definite activity among the body of Christ, members of the body of Christ, and that activity is to make himself look like a messenger of Jesus Christ. I think what many Christians would anticipate is that Satan would come in and begin immediately to tear down everything that's truth, to absolutely undermine all of the deity of Christ, and, and that's what he does. But he does that by making himself up as a super actor to look exactly like a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're talking award-winning, Grammy award-winning, okay? That says to me, if you are not in the family, in the household of God, you're probably going to find Satan in demon worship or, or whatever it might be. But if you are a member of God's family, if you are a member of His household, the household of God, where you want to look for Satan's activities is in a pulpit, in the evangelist, in the guy knocking on your door in the one carrying what he says is the gospel to you. He may or he may not be a true apostle. One needs to look at the bait, not the apostle. And don't, folks, don't get the idea that Satan is so limited, so weak, and so ignorant, so stupid that you know he doesn't know how to make himself up with good makeup. I believe if, if Satan makes himself up to look like a minister of Jesus Christ, that's exactly what he's going to look like. And it's going to take great care to look at the bait, to look at the spirit, to look at what's taught, to decide whether or not that man is in fact a false apostle. I think the text is saying, when he makes himself up to look like a minister of Jesus Christ, you see a man who's extremely kind, courteous, long-suffering, gentle, helps meet your needs, cares about you, loves your, your, your whole entire family, loves your dog, okay? You know, as Pastor Steve, don't you believe that God intended that every man have a happy marriage? Absolutely not. Of course not. What a ridiculous thing to say. You know, if you're going to say that, you might as well say that God intended every one of you to be rich.
every one of you be super healthy or that and you know and that infers that every one of you who isn't super healthy is sinning you know terrible t things to say and yet, yet i see that every day every day when i look around who's who somehow missed some people have somehow missed the epistle of, to the Ephesian, uh, to the ephesians you know it's all about our relationship with Christ and the church. You know, I want you to know that I'm speaking concerning Christ and the church. And oh, incidentally, you know, a man ought to love his wife and she ought to reverence him. But all the rest of that text was su supremely involved with the relationship between Christ and the church. And I believe it is extremely important that Christians recognize that God's great revelation is spiritual. Now, I'm not saying we ought to spiritualize everything, but that the underlying greatness of the Word of God is our relationship to Jesus Christ and everything else is incidental. You know, we, we, we saw back in Colossians, Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, and, and so forth. Now, if I stress the moral application, then, well, then anybody can counterfeit it. I believe a man can be absolutely perfect morally and go to hell, go straight to hell. And here's a Christian headed for heaven. He's not very good morally. Folks, I believe you can concentrate on the physical and be very pure, very clean. You can do all of that and not be redeemed. However, if you are redeemed and you concentrate on the spiritual relationship, it is inconceivable to me that you would be deeply involved with the Lord Jesus Christ and greatly immoral. I can't imagine that. I mean, that can't be counterfeited the other way. It just, it can't. Well, Pastor, I think Paul's thorn in the flesh was a lust for sex, you know, because he never got married. Now, now, how can somebody come up with that? You know, he, he, he couldn't have been a, a Pharisee of the Pharisees if he wasn't married. He, in fact, he probably had kids. What I'm suggesting here is that there are areas where Christians are being trapped every day. It's a, a minefield out there, folks. As soon as I get my life straight with the Lord, He's going to cure this, this cancer. You know, I don't believe, Steve, that God intended that we suffer. Well, what Bible are you reading? Folks, if I don't suffer, I'm never going to be called to evaluate the depth of my faith and my trust in Christ. I believe that if I concentrate on my spiritual relationship to the Lord Jesus Christ, it'll be a humbling situation. If I concentrate on the moral purity of my life, it'll be a situation that genders pride. Well, I'm glad I'm not like them folks. Boy, I... I don't live like that. Concentrating on the physical aspects of biblical truth always genders pride. Concentrating on the spiritual aspects draws us closer and closer to the Lord Jesus Christ. Satan's ability to make himself up as a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ is really good, folks. And it takes some desperately serious Bible study to decide whether or not this is bait or truth. Therefore, we shouldn't be greatly amazed if his ministers also make themselves up to look like ministers of righteousness. However, however, their end, my text says, is according to their works. I'm going to stop there because I, I want to look at, uh, at that end a little bit more and see what the end means look i love you all i truly do we pray for you constantly please continue to pray for the direction of this ministry until next time thanks for watching